can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And lately, you know, Jason, I've been having top VCs investors on. And Zach Zeitlin of New Ground Ventures um, invested in Pipedrive, Kavita. But what I like to ask is biggest misses. So he said their biggest miss was Peloton. And he explains why they passed on Peloton. Uh, Yossi Vardy, he passed on Waze which ended up selling for a billion dollars to Google, and John Medved passed on Salesforce. He was personal friends with Mark Benioff, who brought him, like before, I, I don't know how early on, but say, hey, do you want to invest in this thing I'm thinking of? It's called Salesforce, and he passed on that. So that was uh, a big miss. So check out that. Many more episodes on inspiredinsider.com. Before I talk to today's guest, Jason Swank, and you could check out another episode that we did, this one specifically on growth through acquisition, because he started a new venture. It's, you know, growing very rapidly. So we're going to talk about that. Um, But this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And what we do is we help B2B businesses give to and connect to your Dream 100 partnerships and clients and help you run your podcast. Um, Jason has touted the amazing things about a podcast. So have I for, for the past over 10 years. It's been the best thing that helps me give to my best relationships and profile them and their thought leadership and give to, to the amazing relationships I have. So if you thought about starting a podcast, do it. Whether you use us or not, just do it. Um, but if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. Um, today's guest, also I wanna thank Ian Garlic, who's our giant, tall friend, mutual friend, um, iangarlic.com. And whenever, you know, seriously, Jason, whenever I listen, we were talking before I hit record, whenever I listen to Ian and Jason's advice, you know, we have a smoother onboarding process with clients, and we help them, we help them, their business grow, which helps our business grow. So I encourage everyone to go to jasonswink.com. Follow every, like all of his advice, really. Like just don't ask questions. You could ask questions, but just follow the advice, okay? Um, so we have Jason Swank. He helps agencies, owners grow their agencies faster. He created the resource he wish he had when he had his agency and sold it. Go to jasonswank.com. He has two podcasts, Smart Agency Masterclass and Swank Today. Um, you know, you can check out the past episode where we talk about how he ended up quitting his job, launching a digital marketing agent, growing into a multi-million dollar operation, having, you know, customers, clients like AT&T, Hitachi, Lotus, many more. Um, now he right now, uh, helps agencies, but he also, they, um, buy agencies. So you can go to jasonswank.com slash sell agency. And I also, Jason, I want to mention, you know, we follow and we listen to your advice on blueprints and actually making the client onboarding process easy and seamless and having a great experience. I just got off one like 10 minutes ago and people love the process and it's a process that's a foot in the door, right? It gets you um, showing them value. So you can go to jasonswink.com slash foot in the door and look at him and I and walking them through, walking you through that process. So Jason, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks. And talking about big whiffs, like, you know, Salesforce and all that. Yeah. My big whiff was on Elf on the Shelf. <laughs> <laughs> they were Yo, like, can yeah, you do this happened? website? Can you do this website and take ownership or take part in ownership? I was like, no, nah, this is the dumbest idea ever. And every, every holiday I'm hiding that damn Elf. <laughs> you know what? I, I could totally see myself doing the exact same thing. Is that typical? Will people offer equity for, or do you, you, what's your recommendation for an agency who goes, yeah, like I'll pay you something, but I want to give you some equity in, is it paying you less. What do you recommend? I mean, most of the time I always say no, like yeah. I've, I've said yes in the past and got burned. And then, and then that opportunity comes. I mean, that was just like, you know, driving by the gas station that won a million dollar ticket and you, you didn't, you're kicking yourself cause you're like, I didn't buy a ticket, but you never buy a ticket. Right. So I can't really kick myself yeah, right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it was like the same thing. Like I had Nolan Bushnell, right? He was Steve Jobs' mentor and he said, Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and he said oh no. So God. like, he's like, Jeremy, you understand at that time, that money was worth maybe 300, 400,000 and it's like a 21-year-old punk kid. Like how would you know he would start for the next Apple? But you still kick yourself. 
you know, oh, well, it um, makes a good story. <laughs> yeah, it makes a good story. Um, so let's talk about growth or acquisition, you know, cause you, um, live this, you've talked about it a lot recently and I'm looking for, you know, people can check that out, but what are, what do you look for? I guess in an agency when you're buying well, first off, you have to be profitable. A lot of times, especially at the times we're going through now, right? Like there's a lot of uncertainty for a lot of different people. And people are like, oh, I want to take advantage of people and buy these agencies that are struggling. And I'm like, that's the wrong move, right? Like you want to buy, you don't want to buy something to fix it. You want to buy something where two plus two equals 16, right? Um, and so we're looking for profitable agencies that, um, or over a million in EBITDA, which is like net profit, you know, that they have a high value in monthly recurring revenue. They have, um, they've been growing their accounts over time, right? They're what we call uh, average expense in revenue. You know, they have a average contract term that's two plus years, right? Your clients are with you for at least two years and more. So, you know, some, those are some of the things that we're looking at, but you know, we're, with Republics, you know, we're just trying to build that, you know, that world leading, you know, growth service platform. So we're buying agencies and technology companies and just making sure that we can be that one stop shop for all that growth. And uh, it's really exciting about how fastly it's actually grown. What made you decide to start it? Well, it wasn't my idea. So it was uh, our CEO, Thomas, uh, Thomas's idea. And he came to me a uh, he had a, a small agency, right? And, and this is a really amazing story, right? So Thomas came to me, he has five kids too, which is nuts. And wow. he looks like he's 20, but he's not. <laughs> um, so at first I was like, well, who is this person? So I did some research, but he was like, Jason, like we followed your advice for years and years and we've grown our, our agency. His agency was irrational up in Canada. And at the time, they were a little over a million in revenue, right? Net profit was, you know, a lot lower. And he was like, we want to grow through acquisition. I was like, okay. I was like, well, tell us kind of the idea. What do you want? And they were like, we want you to be part of this. We're putting some other people, keep people together. And I said, okay. I was like, you know, you've kind of like, we have the same values, that kind of stuff. And he just put together a really amazing team, you know, from, People, you know, obviously I'm, I'm the, uh, you know, the, the I'm not industry expert kind of, I always hate that. Like, like I understand agencies, right? So I'm yeah. on the agency side. Then we have a banking side. We have a legal side. We have a tax side. We have an M and a side. Right. And so like you get all the expertise of these types of people and you can do amazing things. Like in, I was telling you in the pre-show 11 months ago, we started from zero and we've done seven acquisitions already. Wow. So it's crazy. How long does it, when, when you, how does the vetting process work? So like someone comes to you, what happens? It's pretty quick, right? So here's the other, we'll tell people be like, look, we want to close in 90 to 120 days. And, and we tell them up front, we're like, this is how we're going to structure the deal. Right. We'll be like, this is how we'll evaluate your agency. So we'll say, let's look at your net profit. We'll give you anywhere from four to five X as a valuation. And then 50% of that is gonna be a cash buyout up front. And then the other 50 is gonna be equity in the new entity. And our whole goal is to grow it to 50 million in EBITDA and then sell it or go public. And we're actually really getting, getting a lot closer than I thought um, right now. And so, and then we say the other 50% in equity, our whole goal for you is to make 10 times that right. when we do have that, you know, um, that milestone that we actually hit. So let's say your, your agency's uh, valued at 10 million. We'll give you 5 million in cash, right? If they, and the, here's the other deal too, I, 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 that I really like of what we've done. If they go, well, Jason, I want to hold on to the agency for a little bit longer because I think next year we can double. We'll be like, cool, no problem. We'll give you an extra, we'll give you that valuation, but that other valuation will be in an earnout, And we don't put a time to it. That's the kicker, right? A lot of times when people put a time to an earnout, you can get like, and I've been screwed on this one <laughs> when, when I sold my agency, right? And so we're like, hey, whenever you double, then we'll give you that valuation and then you'll get the, 
you know, the extra cash and, and all of that. Um, and so it takes a risk off the table for them. Actually. Yeah. And it takes chips off the table, right? So think about people have built this business over the years and there's a lot of uncertainty coming up, um, but they've been doing well. They've been trending up, but they're like, I'd like to cash in some like perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then they have this huge opportunity for even a monstrous because going back to that $10 million valuation, if we could turn that other 5 million in equity into 50 million, right. I like, or even half that. So, yeah, I, we'll talk about that because it's, it's very, it becomes very attractive the larger you get. And, and so I want to talk about the initial people cause you, you sort of have to sell them the vision and now you don't because you're, you're, you have the, you know, the proof and the street cred. Um, but I want to talk about the earnout for a second because it's, it's so more, it's interesting, Jason, like you go out and you kind of, create things that you wish you had, right? You create the agency, um, you know, the playbook and the mastermind, everything. And this is kind of the acquirer you wish you had. And so I want you to talk about, because the earnout piece, what you typically instruct people in a typical, I guess, acquisition fashion, what you instruct them to do about the earnout. And now what you guys are doing is different. So what's your exactly. typical advice and what happened to you with the earnout? I used to, well, so my earnout was based on a set time, right? Um, so I got a lot of cash up front and then I had a lot tied up into an earnout um, or in the event that they sold again. And so they picked a date to sell right when we got dipped outside of a window of a certain revenue goal um, that we couldn't control anymore, right? And when we were um, acquired, you know, our brand went away, all of our control went away, people, everything was restructured. So it was really kind of messed up. And so you got to kind of find out too, I always tell people like, why are they buying you? So I found out they were just buying us for revenue and they wanted to do a quick sale, quick flip, um, you know, after that. So, and I was going into it, not knowing anything, but I was still happy with the the transaction because you know, the money that we got up front. And that's what I always tell everybody always treat an earnout like you'll never get it. Right. But if it happens, amazing. Right. So always like going back to, you know, if you're, if we value the agency at 10 million, treat the 5 million, uh, you know, as like, would you be happy with just that? Right. But the, the cool thing that we're, we're doing at Republics is, we're letting them operate and we're not even telling anybody we bought you other than your, your team, right? Even your clients, we'll tell them nine months later because we want you to operate that and we'll support you up. However, we can get you over that line, whether you need more cash, more leadership, you hate doing this one thing, we'll take that over. And then we'll reach out to the clients, be like, hey, how's everything going, you know, nine months later. And then when they're like, oh, great, man, you guys are fantastic. Well, hey, I want to let you know we got sold nine months ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so it's just, it's been working out uh, way better than I thought. <laughs> you know, Jason, talk about that with the controls and keeping the leadership team on. Because I imagine maybe Thomas decided, wait, what, what do we do? We have... Maybe we could have economies of scale and, and take certain things off, but it sounds like you made the decision, conscious decision to say, we're keeping everyone on, we're keeping it as is. What was that decision like? And I guess, is there anything that people lean on you for? Like, you know what? I think we should use you for this type of thing, even though we have it in-house. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest reason why to keep the leadership team on is because if that owner or that leadership team wants out, they, they control everything, right? And if they do want out, maybe someone would buy them, but they're going to have a lot bigger earnout because there's way more risk for that acquirer to buy them. Because a lot of times the leadership team is everything. That owner is everything. And, and that's the other thing too, as agencies, whether, you know, like if you guys have plans to sell or maybe you want the option, that's what I always tell everybody, have the option to sell. Because if you create an amazing business, amazing agency that you're doing the stuff that you love doing and it doesn't require you to do the crap you don't like anymore and you have a lot of systems, you don't have to sell, right? You're getting a huge check every month or every year. You're doing what you want. Why would you sell? Unless it could be 
a, a huge, huge exit. And a lot of times too, like I was told, I don't, I can't remember if I told you guys on the, the first interview we did when I sold, I was completely depressed. Right. I didn't know what I was going to do. So there's, you just have to weigh. You the, like lose your purpose. Exactly. Until I found this, I was like, Oh, thank God. <laughs> it's like, what's but, the concern uh, Jason with, you know, what do you look for in the personality of the founder? Because there may be a concern that they're going to leave. They're entrepreneurial. Yeah, I think you've talked about how when you sold, you're like, I am a bad employee. I don't want to stay. I don't want to work for someone else, even though you're still working for yourself. So is there something you look for in the founder that you're like, okay, we're going to pay them. And then they're like, oh, cool. I'm going to the Bahamas. Jason, thanks. Well, yeah. with, with me, you know, I didn't, I didn't really understand the vision. They never ex explained the vision to us, right? Um, the culture was there, I felt, right? So the culture has to be there, but I think the, the founder that you're acquiring has to share the same vision mm -hmm. and believe in that vision. That's the most important thing. It's kind of like, you know, if you're getting on a boat, you got to know where that boat's going. You know, if it's going to Australia, you don't want to go to Australia. Well, you're going to be on that boat for a long time and you can't get off. So I think that's the number one thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's an example of that? Like, let's say you, you've probably gone through a lot of due diligence with companies that listen, the EBITDA, you know, it's there, the growth is there, but the founder vision was not there. What was that conversation? Like, what were, what were they saying? Um, that it didn't fit, but everything else fit, or maybe there wasn't a scenario like that. Yeah. Oh, we, we talk to people all the time that we were like, Hey, this is not the right fit. Right. Like we could just tell their, and most of the time it's kind of like a gut, you know, intuition, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, there's something not right. Like you're telling me you're this much in EBITDA, all of your employees are contractors. Um, but you're saying you're not in the business hardly anymore. Um, uh, and you, you want to stay on, but then you have all these other businesses on the side, like, right. Like it's like, it just doesn't align. Like they can, seem like they're not all in. You can see the writing on the wall. Like they just want to get as much from you and then be like, peace out. Right. Yeah. So you, you kind of see maybe a pattern of they have other things going on. Maybe, you know, they're not all in on what they're doing. Maybe you, you see maybe a sense of their passion for what they're doing. Um, what about the, so, Early on, when you were getting those first few companies, like, listen, you get 50% equity in this larger thing. We sell it. You're going to make 10 times. Now it seems almost obvious, right? It's like, okay, we're growing at a clip of X amount. Get on board before we can't take you anymore, right? But at the time, what was it like selling those first few companies on that vision of we're going to be a coin? Because I guess Thomas had to sell you on this and then you know, you have to, each company you talk to in the early stages, it's, it's not like, oh, this is obvious. You guys are growing at whatever amount. It was easier for me because I could kind of look at it be like, what's the worst that could happen, right? Like I'm not selling my company, right? But I also had to have like, I, I believed in what he was doing, but then I was always, also had in the back of my head, like this is a 60, 40 shot, 60% it's going to blow up, 40% it'll work. So I was willing to take that risk with the amount of time that I needed to put into it, right? For the first couple of agencies we bought, I think they were a little crazy, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, like it was a gamble. Like they literally went to Vegas and was like, put it all on red. <laughs> Honest, I mean, truthfully, right? Like, Well, they still get, I guess, 50% cash and then equity. And then they have that option, that, that non- like ticking time earn out so that they still get something, but, but there's, but we still, didn't have like a track record. It's still a gamble right? for the, for the equity piece. Yeah, exactly. Cause I always tell everybody, I'm like, Hey, talk to some people that have gone through it. If they can tell you, right. Yeah. Um, you know, tell them about your, their experience and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and in that scenario, like, cause we didn't do it before. It was like, they just had to trust, trust us. Um, and just believe in it. And, uh, yeah. So yeah, it was, uh, it's interesting. It, it was a gamble. <laughs> what have you learned in the process? Like, you know, obviously running your agency from the first day you started it, when you talk about, well, I didn't even know what a proposal was to, <laughs> to the end of it, when you're an expert, 
What have you learned so far in this process of acquiring companies from, that you're like, wow, like in the beginning, I didn't know X, Y, Z, but now this is super valuable for acquisitions. Well, I understand the KPIs, right? Hmm. That you should be really looking at on an ongoing basis to make sure that you're trending in the right direction. Like, you know, one, like everybody always talks about top line revenue. Oh, you know, like, you know, not to poo poo on, on Gary Vaynerchuk cause he's a, a, incredible, but he would always talk about, I'm a hundred million dollar agency. I'm a $200 million agency. And there's a lot of agencies that follow him obviously, cause he's an amazing person an amazing business person, but he's also giving people the wrong number to shoot for. It's not about getting that number. It's about getting, what is the profit? How much is the actual agency making? And if I had to guess, because, you know, knowing a little bit about, you know, you know, who he is and what he's doing, he's using that agency as a break even or even a loss leader in order to build the other stuff. So a lot of these agencies are like, oh, we need to get hundred million, 200 million. And I used to look at it that way as well, of growing an agency going, you know, um, oh, you know, I'm looking at these, uh, um, you know, tribal DB or DBO and grays of, of the world and all these big agents. I'm like, we need to get to that level. But then if you really kind of uncover some of that, if you look at their books, they may not be as profitable as you think. And so I always tell everybody, you know, the most important number is EBITDA, right? Which is net profit in general sense, right? Um, the next is, you know, what's your monthly reoccurring revenue, right? Like, and try to put, now we, our agency was about 75% projects, 25% reoccurring. Mm. We just had a really good system for generating leads and, and sales and building the pipeline, but it is stressful, right? Especially when you have a lot of people. So reoccurring revenue was another KPI I wanted to see, you know, growing. Also kind of what I briefly talked about, like ACT, you know, the um, average contract term mm. that you have. You know, what's your churn rate or your retention rate, right? You know, and keeping those under. And then what's your average expansion revenue? Like the accounts that I'm getting today. So if I'm bringing an account at 100K a month, well, what's the average I can grow that to? Can I double that? And then the last part is like net promoter score. You know, what's your net promoter score? Like, are people promoting you? Or are they like, oh yeah, the average. Or are they talking shit about you? <laughs> <laughs> For that proponent store, so how do you recommend? Because I imagine there's, there's some of each of these that most people don't track at all and they're not doing at all. They're you probably know? just looking at the bank account for the most part. <laughs> that's what we did for a number of years, right? They're like, oh, that's how I'm going to do my budget. I'm going to look at this bank account. <laughs> are there certain software or tools you recommend for, let's just take net promoter store, for example. Is there anything you recommend for that? And I'm curious, like churn rate or, or anything like, you know, what would be for that? But what do, what do you recommend? Implementing? Yeah, and the net promoter score, I mean, any um, email marketing or uh, any uh, email automation tool could actually do this. And, and so what we'll do is every quarter we'll send out a brief survey. It says on a one to 10, how are we doing? <laughs> 10 being the best, one, we suck. And then, you know, how, and it's just one answer, right? It's like 10 or eight. And so if you're a 10 through eight, you're a promoter. If you're a seven or uh, I'm sorry, 10 through nine, you're a promoter. Um, eight to seven, it's okay. Six below, you know, you're talking shit about them. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you trigger different automation. And then we just take the average. Now there's, I, we were talking about in the mastermind, I can't remember the tool that a lot of people are using um, that actually tracks that. But I bet if you typed in net promoter yep. score report or tracker, yeah. I'm sure it would. Uh, I know some people even put it in their email signature. You know, they'll, they'll have it literally for every email signature is like, how do you rate my customers or whatever, you know, some of the companies, how do you rate my customer support? And you can actually fill it out. But a dedicated email for it is really going to make people pay attention, actually fill it out as opposed to, you know, click it in an uh, in email signature. Yeah. And keep it simple. And, you know, we were talking about in the mastermind, we were like, should we do it once a week, or once a month? I was like, God, no. I was like, like once a quarter or six months. Um, you know, is, is enough. Um, and then if you do, do it once a year, I, I think you're, you're missing out. What have you found, Jason, with acquisitions of people not knowing their numbers? Because you mentioned like average contract term, churn rate, you know, average expansion. Or is there one that just people neglect that they just need to start paying attention to right now? Well, the bigger they get, 
obviously the more people that they have helping so they can yeah. figure out those numbers right but it is surprising with some people they don't know they just know their top line revenue and and i'm like well what's your mmr and they're like what, what what what's your ebitda all right or and you know it kind of throws them off and it's surprising too of some some of the bigger people that we chat with but you know when we come across like an agency that knows these numbers like we get more excited yeah right, right? because we know there's there it's going to be a good good um you know acquisition the same thing like when we start going through our acquisition whenever they asked us something we got it like right there we knew it like we knew our numbers it's kind of like you watch the train wrecks on shark tank right yeah people that come in they don't know their numbers they don't know how much it takes to acquire a customer you know they don't like they have no plan they're just like I have this cool idea. I'm going to put this elf on the shelf. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody it. And then, then this guy, Jason Swank, than... passed on us. We're going to make him pay. Oh, um, such a bad, bad idea. That, um, uh, what's a, what should someone be shooting for as an agency for net profit? What's a good percentage? I feel if you want to sell your agency and, yeah. and get a good multiple, you have to be over a million in EBITDA. Mm-hmm. If you're under that, your valuation goes down dramatically. It could go down to two to three X, sometimes one. Mm. Okay. So if you're at 2 million in EBITDA, you know, we'll, 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 we'll value your agency at maybe 300. Right. But if you can get to a million, we'll value it at four to five. Right. And there's just such a big Delta, you know, you know, um, you know, going through. And then if you can get to 3 million in EBITDA, we can bump that multiple up a little bit more. Right. And that's the whole goal, like our, the whole goal with this agency and a lot of agencies that are actually doing this, right? Like this is not a new concept. We didn't come up with a new concept. People have been doing this for a lot, you know, many years and in many different um, industries, right? But if you can get to, you know, 50 million in EBITDA, yeah. good God, who knows what the multiple is. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I have someone who I know who does this in the dental space. So maybe they're good for your podcast. I don't know. Maybe not. But um, from, from if you think of gross, pro, gross revenue, is in, let's say someone's doing $5 million or 10 or whatever it is, what's the percentage that would be good to shoot for, um, for net profit off of that? So if someone's doing like $10 million, what, what are you like, hey, you should be in this range? Yeah, around 30%. 30%. Um, yeah, and that's mainly for service-based business. I remember um, uh, one of the major organizations um, that does a ton of surveys, or hey, SBA, I, don't, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But I think for service-based businesses, the average um, um, profit margins were around 31 or 33%. Mm-hmm. So I always tell agencies, I'm like, shoot for 30. Mm-hmm. If you can get more, great. Obviously, you always want as much as you can. But, you know, if you're in a growth year, like, or if you're investing a lot, you know, that's perfectly fine. Like, don't worry about it. Like, you know, we're, we were talking about, um, in another group in the mastermind, we were talking about like, um, all right, a lot of times if you do want to grow through acquisition, let's say you're going to take out a loan of a million dollars, just keep that number easy. And then you, you buy the agency Well, you're wanting them to make you 10 times that, right? Well, if you still took out that same loan and you invested in your company doing what you need it, could you get that? And the, possibly the answer is yes. So there's, there's multiple, multiple ways to do it. You know, it's a, it's kind of just fitting the right puzzle piece together. <laughs> yeah. And with an agency too, obviously like as you grow, you sometimes need to staff up. So some of the, the costs of labor, um, similar to e-commerce, like if you grow, you start to have to invest capital more inventory because you, so the same thing goes, you kind of have to staff up as you grow too. So you're going to, ha- you're, I mean, going to have to invest in, in talent. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Keep, and keep this in mind too. Uh, a lot of times um, as business owners, uh, not me, because I do everything by the book, we um, put some expenses on the books that you probably shouldn't. <laughs> I'm perfect. <laughs> you are. Um, yeah. Race I'm cars, the, check. Race I am cars the, on the, I'm on the, the exception. Yes. Right. And so it would actually hurt your number because at the end of the day, at the end of the year for your company or whenever you do your taxes, you want that kind of almost to be as close to zero. 
right? So you try to do that. But when you actually go through an acquisition, what the acquirer is going to do and what you should be doing if you're working with someone smart is you'll recast. So you'll look at all the unnecessary expenses you have on the books that are going to go away after someone buys you and then you recast it. And you also got to make sure you're paying yourself a decent salary. You can't be like, my margins are huge, but I've never taken a salary in five right. years. Yeah. I'm like, you got to pay someone to do your job unless you're not doing anything. Because they'd have to replace you and then they have to add, you know, they add that back in and subtract it off of the net profit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, are there certain types of agencies you look at, look for right now? Like, or, or stay away from? Like, listen, we don't want this type of agency. Traditional or- agencies, <laughs> right? We only want digital agencies. We mm-hmm. want those innovators. We want the ones that are the best at SEO in a particular market. We want those email. We want the social, right? We want the design. Uh, you know, we want the technology companies, the dev shops, right? We, you know, our whole goal is to be that all-in-one solution that can get the results to all these clients that we need. Um, and yeah, so it's the, the really the only agencies we're not looking at are the traditional ones. You yeah. Know? Talk about that. So what, what would be some examples of traditional agencies? Cause like when people think, I think Jason now agency, I don't know. I picture only digital. Like when you say agency, I just picture digital. So when you say traditional, I'm like, what, what would be considered a traditional agency? Traditional. Yeah. They're not doing anything on the digital space. Right. They are just coming up with the idea for the commercial. And then they're just doing a commercial for the Super Bowl, but they're not taking any of those assets and coming up with strategy in order to, you know, put that, you know, on Facebook and Twitter, TikTok, whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're just, they got their blinders on or they're just media buying for TV or billboards outdoor. Right but they're not doing media buying on Facebook or AdWords or any of the other platforms. And that's what I look at as traditional. Yeah. And the, those, those agencies, you know, I look at those as more as the Mad Men and they're starting to really kind of, they're the bigger ones have been acquiring digital agencies to get that expertise. Right. Right. Um, so there's not, there's not too many around. Um, <laughs> But that's maybe, the, that was their initial focus, you know, was kind of like offline component, didn't have a digital arm. And then they're right. discovering quickly, like we need to gain that digital arm. So they may start acquiring. Yeah, it's the, the people that haven't, they're the laggards. They haven't adapted. Yeah. The ones that say, we, we've done it this way for years and years and we'll keep doing it. I'm like, all right, good luck. So I figured, Jason, like we could walk through maybe one of the deals. You can mention name or not, but like from, okay, they found you, you found them. What's one good example you can walk through and you don't have to, you know, obviously you can protect the numbers, but maybe just talk about, you know, the typical deal structure and what ended up happening in the transition. Well, who's one that would be a good example to chat with from the the onset? Yeah. Let's use the example that we um, just went through a little while. We won't mention the names because we, but we'll, this is the same, the same deal. So yeah. they were a little over the million in EBITDA. So we were like, okay, cool. We'll give you a valuation of 5 million. So two and a half was cash. The other two and a half was in equity. They also got a leadership role. So they can continue. We kept, right. We took over everything and they can actually get dividends and, or um, distributions. So as we go through more acquisitions and grow, they keep benefiting. Um, and then they also had part of an earnout because they were like, well, we're going to do this next year. We're like, okay, if you do this next year, we'll give you this, you know, percentage more in cash, you know, going forward. Um, so it's really pretty easy. And most of the time, uh, I think that took, I don't know, like a hundred days, I think mm-hmm. from start to finish. Um, and just to let everybody know, kind of like, we we'll have an initial conversation, right? We'll say, here's the vision. Here's, and we, I basically, whenever I'm chatting with them, be like, here's kind of, here's the deal. Like there's really, there's no negotiating. Like we're giving you the best deal. Um, and then if they're like, yeah, let's proceed. Then we'll do a letter of intent, um, letting them know here's the structure. And then we start going through our due diligence and then we go through it. And then we go to closing pretty easy. 
And then afterwards, what type of uh, are there any specific resources like, okay, now you could tap into X, Y, Z, or is it more like business as usual for them? Well, they can, they can always tap on the, uh, the mothership uh, whenever yeah. they need. And we'll, we'll let them, we just hired a COO um, and she's come from a background of just growing huge companies and really integrating everybody together. That's the next big challenge for us, right? Cause you just can't like, if you're going to grow through acquisition, it's not all about, buying companies for the revenue, buying right, and then selling, you have to prove it all works. So now we're going through the process of integrating everybody. But that's what I also like about keeping all the leadership team and the brand and everything together. It gives us a lot better runway to figure it all out. Yeah. Um, Have you found those people tapping into, or what questions are they asking or expertise are they tapping into now that it's kind of, they're part of a larger organization? You'll have to ask Thomas. He's more yeah. in the day to day. Got him. Um, so I, I'm not, uh, and I don't want to be in his back part. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't comment on that. Do you find uh, what opportunities do you see actually? Because you're a good person. Like, well, you know, I see you guys do SEO. You could start sell, you know, offering these services, which is part of the mothership. How is the, I guess, cross selling going to increase everyone else's uh, companies? Oh, big time, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, we'll give them the tools or the identifiers being like, look, now we have SEO or now we have pay-per-click or now we have UX, right? Like we have all these expertise. Here are the leading indicators that could prompt us. And then we'll bring those up in ongoing meetings. Be like, oh, you know, ABC had, you know, was talking about, you know, their conversion suck. Oh, well, cool. We just bought this you know, convert, uh, you know, optimization, you know, agency and all this yeah. kind of stuff. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I could totally see. Cause they're, they're going to benefit in the long run when the whole, the whole, everything gets purchased. So them recommending not just for obviously helping the client, but it's also going to benefit their, their equity stake. I oh, guess big you could time. Say. Yeah. And, it, and you know, it's, it's, you know, our whole motto is we're better together. Yeah. Right. Are there any, Jason, um, you know, services right now, uh, maybe you don't look at it like that, but like, hey, we're kind of, we need this type of agency. We get this demand from like all the, all the customers, like what, let's make example, like conversion optimization. Like, what, is there a service that people are find, asking for? They're like, we need to look in and find an agency that does this because that will not only be good for the portfolio, but it also will grow because we have all these referrals coming in. Is there anything you know, particular? Uh, analytics, mm. you know, analytics is always huge, right? And, um, you know, so, I mean, but at the like, and also even in technology too, right? Like, you know, even back at, you know, our agency when we were creating content management systems and e-commerce systems and all that kind of stuff, it was like, how can, um, how can we deliver a better solution, right? It's more about figuring out what's the right solution you know, for people rather than a particular service. Um, because now with like seven acquisitions and, and, and all of that, like we pretty much have all of that covered. Now it's just kind of bolting on, how can we get better, 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 better. And, um, you know, with, with this, like I know with the agency, you have certain recommendations. You're like, listen, I recommend, or for you is like, I recommend project manager. You need to, if you don't have one, you need to get a project manager for this business, it seems like you have the banking, the legal, the tax, the COO. What do you think the next kind of build out of the team member is needed? We're about to bring in a CFO mm -hmm. as well, right? You got to have that, that incredible numbers person <laughs> that can make it all work. Um, and I think that's the last piece of that puzzle. And then we'll figure it out from there, right? Like that's the thing about growing a business. It's like playing a monopoly game. Like you don't ever know where you're going to land and you can try to like, you could try to figure it out, but it's more about, you know, here's where we're going to try to take it and then just adjust as we're going uh, rather than have something in cement. And then you're kind of, a, it's a little harder to, you know, turn the Titanic. Yeah. And Jason, from the agency owner standpoint of sequential, hires. What's a typical, you know, I guess, what's your recommendation? Let's say it's like a couple person agency. 
what are the hires that people should be looking at um, in the in the horizon for as they grow? Well, you got to kind of do a self valuation first on yourself, right? Like, what are you really good at? And what do you suck at? And you should hire based on what you suck at. <laughs> yeah, right. So if you're amazing at sales, great, hire an operations person, or someone to help you with that. I'm not talk, excuse me, I'm not talking about hiring a COO, you know, in the very beginning, hire like an ops manager, right, they can help out with the systems and the process. Versus if you're really good at operations and tasks and all that, hire a salesperson, right? Like hire for your weakness and then build the team around that. Um, and you know, the most important thing is you have to, you know, figure out what are, where are you trying to go, right? It goes back to, you know, our whole goal. Like our whole goal of existence is give the clients an amazing, you know, return on investment and sell, you know, or you look at, you know, our why, at, you know, the jasonswank.com is create a resource I wish I had, right? Like that's the North star. So if you can figure out your North star and then you figure out your core values, like what do you believe in? Then you can start surrounding yourself with amazing people that can do stuff that you can't. And that's yeah. when you start having scale. Yeah. Jason, first of all, thank you. Thanks for always sharing your knowledge. You know, I, I say, you know, check out his podcast um, and go to jasonswink.com. You could check out his podcast, everything he has going on. If you're interested in selling your agency or know someone with an agency who wants to sell, um, you can go to jasonswink.com slash sell agency, or you can go to jasonswink.com slash foot in the door. If you're interested, if you are an agency, you are interested in, you know, how they map out the blueprint and everything else. Jason, thanks for all you do for everyone and putting out the amazing content. Really appreciate it. Oh man. Thanks so much for having me on. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.